Wednesday, August 4th. Uh, today's Faith Day, as we often have on our, our fine Wednesdays. So glad to have you along with us, Doug Padgett here in Minneapolis, and glad to be back. I was away almost all of last week and the last couple of days this week scouting out a trip along the southern border that we're going to be taking this fall with. Uh, there we go. Get to hear me two or three times in this podcast today. I love it. Uh, you, uh, we, We're going to be riding along the southern border of the United States, the northern border of Mexico, and then the coast of the United States as we talk about uh, a more common good way to pursue our immigration and border policy. So a lot about that in our regular streams and flow of Vote Common Good and our sister organization, Greater Things. Glad to have you um, pay attention to all that and join us along, along the way. But today it's Faith Day, and we're going to be talking about the role of toxic masculinity in, in our society. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful topic, and um, glad to be talking about that today with you, Dominique Gilliard. How are you, my friend? Good to see you. I'm good. I'm excited to talk about this uh, critically important conversation, this much neglected conversation. Um, it's been all in the news everywhere, uh, but it's this kind of constant reality uh, that never goes away. Um, our attention might, but uh, the, the consistency of this abuse and uh, these kind of distortions of who we should be in the world have been this constant ethic that has not gone away and has been undressed. But I'm excited uh, to be here and talk about it, coming to you from the metro Atlanta area and uh, going to kick it over to Laura, who's going to kind of introduce herself. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Laura Truax here in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, yeah, as this is going to be a good topic, a meaty topic, I think it's something that we've all experienced or uh, been um, in groups that have experienced toxic mas masculinity at various points in time. Um, that weird concoction of uh, gender and power that is so um, can be very uh, destructive. As a girlfriend said the other day, when is masculinity not toxic? Yeah. I thought, hmm, okay, well, that reframes the question. So I'm eager to, uh, to kind of unpack this with you all. Um, Stephanie, to you now. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here with you all. Another Wednesday, a faithful Wednesday. I am Stephanie Rose Spaulding, pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church of Colorado Springs, and really excited about this conversation because it's one that in faith community, we definitely don't talk about enough. Um, and in broader society, there are some conversations that are being had, but then there are still others that are like, I don't even know what you're talking about or in defense of um, what is understood as toxic masculinity, or some people just don't even, even get it. So before we even get into this conversation, I think it's imperative for us to articulate what toxic masculinity is in and of itself, right? Um, so for those who don't sit in um, like academic text all day long and have conversations around gender and, and things like that, um, masculinity as an expression of gender identity is, is socially constructed, right? And what does that mean? We've been hearing that phrase a lot, that it's socially constructed that it's not something innate, it's not something um, biological, anatomical that creates what masculinity is. It depends on the culture, the behavior, the practice, the accepted norms of a community, um, a society. And so we see that masculinity, how it might be shaped in the United States or expressed in the United States or in a particular community, um, like African-American community, doesn't necessarily always translate in other communities. For example, um, in Latin American communities, males um, and people who um, identify in masculine behaviors might be really comfortable with public displays of um, intimacy and expression, right? Like you might see males holding hands or hugging in public because it's, it's acceptable and it's not questionable to their masculinity um, in that place. But in the United States, we might see that very differently. And, and men might, those who identify as men, those who identify as masculine might not express themselves in that particular way. 
So the expression of masculinity does not exist the same the whole world over. Mm. How do we get to this toxic masculinity? As Laura um, points out, it's a relationship between how we understand what is masculine and then connections between power and violence and um, things that become oppressive and abusive, right? So um, if you're watching the Olympics right now, uh, there, there are a number of ways that toxic masculinity is showing up. For example, you have entire teams that are saying, I am going to, we're not going to come out here in leotards and bikini bottoms, right? Because the, the Olympic structure has said in order for us to qualify and to participate as women in this sport, we must expose our bodies in this particular kind of way. Now, men on the same hand, they can wear like full like body suits and shorts and things that come all mm. the way to their knees. But it is it's rules in some structures that require women to be in bikini bottoms or get fined <laughs> to not be able to play or to be in in leotards that, again, are exposing of the body as if they can't do the same sport, do the same kind of athletic display in differently attired array. So that's been a major conversation. We've also seen like Simone Biles who protected her mental health and said, I am going to pull out of this particular event or this portion of um, the, the gymnastic um, qualifier and, and um, team final. And then we see the, this guy, this tennis player, what's his name, Novik? Um, I can't pronounce his last name. Land blast her, like publicly land blast her and saying like, it's a privilege to be under pressure. And then throw a tantrum when he loses. The his, Djokovic, right? <laughs> exactly, when he loses his opportunity for a bronze medal, right? So it's okay for him to throw a tantrum in public and on the court but it's not okay for this woman, this 24 year old woman to say, no metal is worth my sanity. No metal yeah. is worth my physical um, being, my physical and mental presence, health, and, and who I understand myself to be. Yeah. So these things are happening in society. They're also happening in the church. And I am interested to, to really have this conversation with my colleagues to, to know what they think about like, you know, these yeah. incidences and again, like these institutional structures that allow masculinity access to power, access to violence, access to oppression and so forth. Yeah. And even access to acting out. I mean, I think that Djokovic example was really right on, especially when you think about how uh, the Williams sisters, right? Serena and, and Venus got like blasted for different um, different expressions or reactions they would have on the court, right? Um, yeah. The fact that men can behave badly and then act badly about behaving badly and somehow that's all contained, right? Somehow uh, they they don't get called out for that. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm super curious about the men folk uh, leading out on a, a few observations. What are, what are you guys feeling uh, even this week with those great examples Stephanie laid out? I mean, the classic, you know, boys will be boys, um, and you know. There's, there's just so many societal dodges, to use the language of Resma Minikin, where we never have to actually reckon with kind of how we have normalized toxic behavior or explained it away in a way that never caused us to actually address it and get down to the roots of it to actually kind of, you know, dislodge this as a expectation or a culturally accepted norm for masculine behavior. So same thing would be true with locker room talk, um, how, you know, we saw that really weaponized and deployed in, you know, with in 2016. But well before 2016, locker room talk is something that every male that I know 
um, who has played sports has been exposed to. So it's not this, it's something you're socialized into seeing as not as problematic as it is. It's not as toxic as it is. And it ultimately ends up having implications for how you see women, um, engage uh, with them. Um, and it slowly but surely seduces you into starting to see a woman's value as directly connected to kind of sexual expression. Um, and I think those are the things I, th I remember for me when this conversation, there was that great Gillette commercial that they had come out with that was really trying to name toxic masculinity. And I was like really impressed because I felt like it was one of the more spot on kind of media campaigns I had thought. And it was this huge backlash that Gillette got where people were just like, this isn't a thing. Y'all are like, you know, fabricating stuff to just try to demonize men. This is part of the feminist agenda and all this other stuff. And I was just like, you know, it. I think for me, toxic, part of toxic masculinity is having the power to suppress needed conversations that would call, that would highlight uh, behavior that needs to be addressed and reckoned mm. with. Um, mm. But you have the power to control the narrative and yeah. the the outlooks. That I mean, outlets that would put light on pressure on you to control it. And so you always have the ability to redirect so that you actually never have to actually get down and do the hard work of deconstruction and reconstruction. So yeah. that'll be my initial comments. I'll let yeah. Doug share. Yeah, Dominic, I think you've, you've you really landed on it. You know, I, for a lot of men, their first experience with toxic masculinity is when they're young boys. There's an entire hmm. culture created for young boys to try to figure out what it means to be a man. It's, it's actually one of the kind of dominant questions through adolescence is how, how, how can I be uh, an adult? And that in our society, as Stephanie pointed out, has a gender uh, um, uh, component to it. I think now maybe in some people in society, we talk a little bit more about, about adulting, like just becoming an adult. But at least, you know, if you're in your mid 50s like I am when I was a kid, uh, the question was, are you a man? What's it going to take to be to be a man? So this notion of manhood gets gets created and built. And then you're just experiencing all kinds of cross messages and all kinds of mixed mm -hmm. messages. And mm -hmm. boy, in the world that I was was growing up in, there were all sorts of very direct and implicated clues on how you could be a man. This is where early, you know, homophobic and transphobic and don't be a little girl and don't cry like that. Like somehow everything was trying to suggest that there's some kind of manhood that is unique from everything else. I mean, down to the colors of the clothes that you would wear or how you would walk or if you spoke with a, with a speech pattern that people would, you know, uh, call a lisp or something. That people would frame some notion that there's an idea there's an ideal manhood out there and you're probably not it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. starts to layer into the psyche of an entire society and even into to people when they're, when they're young boys, that really makes masculinity something um, unachievable. And I think it's out of that, that a lot of this like toxicity and a lot of this anger uh, uh, comes out because shockingly, you know, people, when these conversations come up and, and I'm glad to be in them every time I can. So I try to get as many of these conversations about toxic masculinity for me as possible. When these things come up, um, it, some people are surprised to be reminded that toxic masculinity hurts all of society, including men. It's not as if toxic masculinity works great for men. Nobody wants to be yelled at. Nobody wants to be screamed at. Nobody wants to be demeaned. Nobody wants their value of their life to be uh, overrun by someone who's using all kinds of out of control behavior. And as you guys have said so well, we just tolerate this, especially in certain places in our society. You know, thinking about about Andrew Cuomo, Cuomo the governor of New York today, uh, who I heard this morning talking about the sexual allegations against him and and his what I would refer to, you know, as piggish behavior and classic male dominance behavior. Um, 
and and he's like, sure, we, you know, we we do have a tough work environment. Our our work environment is tough. Like, th- toughness is often just code language for you're going to be treated badly, and you're yeah. going to be treated badly here because mm-hmm. you're not uh, because you're not capable to put yeah. up with it. And and so I I don't know. I feel like. Um, Toxic masculinity is something that you're right, Stephanie, really does have to be named because people don't often know the name of it. But it feels to me like the experience of it, once we start re- remembering and our faith communities often reinforce rather than uh, create a solution to ta- toxic masculinity, we all know that, they, uh, that, that we've experienced this kind of thing in our, in our society and how hurtful and harmful it is. Right. And I just want to add it. one oh. quick thing. Um, as somebody who is now raising a boy who is trying to be intentional about the ways in which I saw toxic masculinity integrated into my formation in ways that I don't think that people were fully conscious of, but it was still there, um, mm-hmm. trying to trying to be strategic and intentional about, you know, everything from you know, when you're a little boy and you fall and you hurt yourself and you cry, like don't cry uh, or, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm really trying to unpack the, the impact that has on men's mental health um, Mm -hmm. and like our vulnerability and our inability to be vulnerable with our partners and friends and uh, our unlikeliness to go to therapy and all these different things. And I think it's all connected to the root of how we get formed initially into this toxic understanding of masculinity Mm -hmm. that say that men don't show emotions, men don't cry, men aren't vulnerable, men aren't transparent, Mm -hmm. men like have to have this certain disposition and response to pain that differentiates them from women like that's yeah. part of biologically fundamentally what it means to be a man mm-hmm. and and the other piece that i'd say that's connected to it for most men that i know in most cultures is this connection to like athleticism in sports mm-hmm. like if you are not into sports if you're not athletic if you're not striving towards that if you're not into lifting weights if you're not into any of these things then you're not a man and that really starts to create this whole kind of subculture of people biologically males who don't feel affirmed in their manliness and don't feel like manhood is something that they can actually fit into or ascribe towards and then there's this whole question of identity like and so i think that's the other piece that i just want to kind of throw in there Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no and i I think you had have just hit the the nail on the head it is one First, it has to be said that it, it's not just males who are shaping and um, creating the idea of what masculinity is, that it is all people within um, a society participating in the construction of what masculinity is and is not. Um, and secondly, as you said, it is the root or the root of what becomes toxic is how we understand masculinity in and of itself and how we are constructing masculinity in and of itself as it relates to power as it relates to to violence um and and even to spiritual practice right the way that um in so many traditions that um our spiritual connection to uh deity is and and especially abrahamic tradition is such already couched in this masculine form um and and shape that is angry often as well as gracious right (laughs) um is you know i'm thinking sinners in the hands of an angry god right like that like how this formation of who we understand god to be can also be a part of how we are expecting those who are male to then show up as men, to then mm-hmm. show up as masculine in, in our world. Um, and, and we've created institutions that protect mm-hmm. that behavior, toxic behavior, um, especially in the church um, and seeing it played out so much so that I, I've said this before, that 
I did not know how unique my experience was as a as a young girl growing up in a congregation where my pastor was a woman yeah. in in the 70s and 80s. I didn't know, you know, and and to have the kind of blowback that I I began to get when I went off to college about that experience and whether or not I had good training, you know, um, spiritual training, having been led by a woman for so long. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to lift that up and, and say, Dominic, you're right on point. Yeah. And this, this interesting, um, array of factors that it's, it's socialization, it's parenting, it's the church, it's the language we use for God, it's this deeper, wider framework. It is very difficult to break out of that. It's very difficult to see the bars of your own prison, right? Um, even as, as uh, you guys are talking, I was thinking, um, I was raised by a radical egalitarian father um, who, had five children whose job was to work for him. And we were all working for him. We were, all, you know, with, uh, across the board, we were all working. And I never sensed that there were things that my brothers uh, did out of their gender. They might have done it out of their strength. They might have done it because of their size. They might have done it for because they had a truck and I had a car. I mean, they may have done it for all these different reasons but it was not their gender that gave them that kind of standing. And yet, uh, even yesterday, I was with a, a group of uh, people and we were talking about these experiences and I told them about um, being kind of in this uh, rural area of Tanzania on a trip with several other ministers. We all went back to our cabins at night. I walked in the door and there's this large iguana that met me okay that scurried under my bed <laughs> i'm like oh my god i run out i knock on whose doors i knocked on the two men that i just walked back to our cabins with right and i said you guys there's this iguana go in there and get him and they're like what do you want us to do and i'm like well <laughs> be a man <laughs> do the manly thing yeah. and you know i said that story just yesterday and we laughed about it and I kind of peeled it back and thought, you know, what, whatever made me think that this guy from Seattle is going to have any more bandwidth to get this freaking iguana out of my room than me. Um, but it's that, right? It's this, it's this assumption. It's a socialization piece that somehow I thought, I don't know, don't y'all have some secret yeah. book, you know, which of course I know, <laughs> I know you don't have a secret book. Yeah. But I mean, how do we how do we combat that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's in so many layers. I even think about this in regards to dating, like how a number of men are not open to dating a woman who makes more money than them. Because yeah. for them, being the provider of the home fiscally is part of what it means to be a man. And mm -hmm. if I have a woman who's bringing more to the table than me, then that's actually demascul emasculating me. And mm -hmm. I can't fully and freely be the man I'm supposed to be in a relationship with this woman. So I just won't date women who make us more money than me. Like this stuff is like deep. It's like yeah, it very right. psychological. <laughs> a lot of it we think is just like instinctual or just cultural, but it's rooted in this conversation um, in ways that I think we can name. And there, th there are ways that we can't even, I, I know there's things that that I've been formed and shaped in that I can't, yeah. still can't name. It's a constant process of humbly sitting at, with my sisters and hearing from them because there are blind spots that I have in my formation but I can, there are things that I've been able to parse out as I've been trying to be intentional about like surveying this and opening myself and my life up to my sister to say like, hey, where do you see this in me? Um, mm -hmm. How do you see this at play? Uh, how is this reckoning our institution, our culture, our community that we're trying to build? And, you know, saying, I mean, the last thing I'll just say is it's in movement work. I mean, we always talk about, you know, yeah. the way in which erasure has really uh, 
white uh, has really erased the role, critical role that women have played in movement work in uh, institutional movement building, um, leadership, uh, and so I just across the board there the, the fingerprints of this conversation are all over our society. And to yeah. answer um, Laura's question, like how do we how do we get out our like get outside of this? we have to in, in the same way that we have constructed what is toxic about masculinity we also have to construct what is acceptable and viable about masculinity right to allow for the expansiveness of um, identity and gender expression um, again using the olympic uh, uh, stage right now when we see swimmers who are knitting to normalize that, yeah, men, those who are male might knit, you know, <laughs> like yeah, that is, right. that is a part of, a part of what human beings might be doing with their lives, right? We have to redefine what provision is when we are talking about, well, a man must provide for his family. Maybe provision is not limited to what is fiscal, you know, maybe mm -hmm. provision is, mm -hmm. Um, a partner in which one can dream and share conversation and thought and build, you know, like yeah. there are new ways to know and understand what these concepts and these ideas are. And if we don't commit ourselves to that, then we will continue to perpetuate this notion of, of toxic masculinity to the expectation of, of everyone again. I don't want to extricate any any like gendered community from from the role that is played in in perpetuating ideas around masculinity, femininity, and and so forth. Boy, I think that's that's right there. And you know, in, in the Christian tradition, of the way I read it, my inter personal introduction to Jesus was as an alternative to a whole lot of this stuff. I know that for a lot of people, they had their patriarchy and their masculinity and their religion all uh, swirled together in a you know in a, in a swirl cup of ice cream. So they had three the three flavors mixed in, and they couldn't separate one flavor from the other. Uh, I didn't grow up inside of Christianity, but I did grow up inside of a masculinity dominant society and culture. And when I was introduced to the notion of of Christianity, here I, I was seeing Jesus portrayed as this alternative version of what humanity could look like and what a person mm -hmm. could look like. So you have Jesus saying, welcome the little children. And you begin to recognize, yeah, in a society in which men dominated the religion to welcome children is actually an anti-toxic masculinity movement. Or when Jesus uh, cry, uh, cries out to his mother during during his death, and she's the one that, that he's concerned about, and she needs to be the one that's perpetuated um, and uh, perpetually cared for. And that the birth narrative of Jesus comes from this young girl, not from this older dominant person. And when yeah. the woman who's caught in adultery is protected and not the one who again has uh, masculinity um, used as a weapon against her. Like there's a, a way that it seems that we're supposed to as Christian people recognize that every society is going to face down its patriarchy and its and its uh, masculine battles because i think it comes some out of our out of our um, dna and out of out of our evolution so as we grow as human beings we have to realize we need to respond more than just from our testosterone and our estrogen and, and building bad mm -hmm. practices around some of this mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the fact that like i i, I when I first started going to churches, I went to a church that had this big table in front. I think it was just their communion table, but etched into the front of the table were the two words, remember me. So, you know, long before uh, I learned that from the, the movie Coco with my two-year-old grandson um, that we sing all the time, this idea that like you're supposed to, if you're in the Christian tradition, remember the life and way of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that somehow for so many people it just gets pitched into, well, look, he, he, Jesus really manned up when he went to the tree, like a good soldier, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's the opposite of that story. Mm -hmm. And right. so in so many ways, I feel this personal sense that like Christianity, not only shouldn't be doubling down on this stuff, it really should, as all the faith traditions do provide for the people who are paying attention to its teachings 
an alternative way forward. And, and right. that's the part that just, you know, went. and then I watched male pastors uh, be the sometimes the most expressed version of toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And somehow that that just that just grates at me at an even a deeper level than than when it shows up in, you know, in all the other places that are so, yeah. so evident in our society. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I was just going to say, Go I think it's similar in the way that you know, we don't have racism in the U.S. in the the expression that we do today without the role of the church's theological right. legitimization. Right. Same thing is true in regards to toxic masculinity. Like, without the theological justification and artic- distortions of scripture that have been emboldened toxic, mas- toxic masculinity, uh, it doesn't exist in the same way. And so I think, you know, folks who are like, well, you know, we're we're here in the church to focus on, you know, well, the real distorted version is saving souls. But we're we're here to talk about the gospel. When folks don't understand the way that the gospel has been misused, deployed, and weaponized to actually embolden and legitimate injustice and the oppressive status quo that we are trying to deconstruct in uh, spaces like this, then we are failing to realize what it means for us to be repairers of the breach. Like Mm -hmm. the church has played a fundamental role in creating the breach. And as we come into a revelation of that role, like we are commissioned to actually go into the world and actually do the work of repairing. Mm -hmm. And that reparative work starts with us. It starts with us having that integrity to have these difficult conversations within our communities of faith and actually deconstructing this toxic expression of faith that continues to legitimate and kind of authenticate this kind of behavior within our Mm -hmm. congregations, within the households of our congregants, um, and then to go out and publicly in the culture wars that we see kind of created around this um, and the way in which it gets coupled with fear. And we Mm -hmm. have these full on uh, campaigns waged Mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus that continue to reinforce this kind of uh worldview uh, i think the work really starts at home uh but we are supposed to then go out into the world and be models and actively doing the work of repairing the breach that has kind of been directly connected to the history of theological distortion yeah and you know if i can just jump in on that too dominique i, I really appreciate that um your comments there. And we've got some great comments in the chat. Um, uh, you know, one question, why is this not a major topic in the church? And then the response, well, because the church is toxic masculinity on steroids, right? Um, you know, this is where I, I think it's really helpful to step back and think about uh, where the Bible came from, you know, the culture from which our sacred book um, emerged. And, 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 and how there's always this, no matter what book is being produced, it's it's emerging from a culture. It's emerging from a worldview. When we say that scripture is inspired, it, it's um, it, it's there were people who believed that God was addressing them, and they wrote what they believed God was doing in them and through them and in their people, and they put that out there, but. They don't put that out there removed from their culture. They're absolutely Mm -hmm. a a, a Bedouin man traveling across the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, these things are still true. And um, and I think it's helpful for us to step back for a moment and and be honest about the way in which culture has has formed the Bible. Um, and and we look for those places, and most clearly, we look for it in Jesus, right? We look for it in in the stories that that were always pointing toward a deeper and wider liberation. We're always pointing toward a deeper and wider expression of of God's grace poured out on all humanity. Um, you know, there's it's it's a tired uh, cliche to say that you can justify anything you want from the Bible. Um, yeah, you can. Um, and, and, and that's why we need leaders and, and people, we, us individuals, we've got to be people who are reading and reflecting deeply 
um, not only on the Word of God, but but the the context and uh, culture from which that word comes. Um, which is why I think we can have an example of Jesus being so, as as Doug just beautifully pointed out, uh, his whole life, his teaching, radically open, radically um, against type, uh, against gender type, against male type. Um, and then in a quick, you know, 20 years, you can have the Apostle Paul um, trying to square that example of Jesus in these communities that were embroiled in um, in gender placeness, right? That right. churches that were organized around a household structure of of Rome, of the 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 households that they knew with a paterfamilia, uh, with mm-hmm. with highly prescribed roles, including the role of Onesius, a slave, or Philemon, a slave. Um, And uh, actually, I'm not sure if Philemon was a slave. I I retract that. But Onesius was a slave. Uh, In in kind of this kind of of acceptance, right? Of acceptance of those modalities, because Paul's after a deeper thing. He's after protecting this nascent growing movement uh, that's now trying to identify themselves uh, apart from Judaism and the Jewish rabbi that they're following. So I, I think it's just, um, it's more complex, right? And, mm-hmm. and to one of uh, some of these comments around, um, you know, why don't we talk about this more often? I think because we have a hard time um, explicating that. We have a hard yeah. time giving language um, and, and opening up our sacred texts um it, to to do that at all is to kind of start to raise your hand and be immediately slapped down by people who feel nervous about the, uh, about an interpretation that's what what do you mean you're giving me a benediction that's not father son and holy spirit mm-hmm. you know what do you mean when you say creator redeemer sustainer right it's those are but that's the hard work of being mm-hmm. a disciple um, so I'll get off that soapbox for a moment, yeah, I but like <laughs> I, I do think that that plays into this, doesn't it? Yeah, I do. You know, there's this, this phrase from Jesus that, uh, that sometimes, uh, we feel uncomfortable with because we don't always have a fully developed notion of forgiveness, but it's, it's one of the famous statements of Jesus while being murdered, uh, in his, in his crucifixion where he says, father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Uh-huh. And th- that that can land on people in a way that that they're that they're uncomfortable with. But there's a there's a way to understand that, which I think Jesus was getting at, which is what you're saying, uh, uh, Laura. I, I think in a lot of ways, which is we d- the, our ability to perceive the reality of what's actually happening here. That for human beings, the power of perception and what we literally see and the work that we do in the world. Um, it's really hard. You know, there's this movement of uh, people wearing or putting bumper stickers on the back of their cars that say, start seeing motorcycles. Um, And that comes from people who ride motorcycles because it's dangerous to ride a motorcycle. What doesn't work is just to say to people, start seeing motorcycles. Uh, They have, uh, they have, they have looked at this, right? And they know that the only group that has a lower percentage, almost a zero percentage of hitting people with their vehicle, hitting others who are on motorcycles are people who themselves have a motorcycle license. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's the, it's the experience <laughs> of something that allows you and then having a framework by which you then literally see. And people who hit people on motorcycles will often say, I didn't even see him. And the motorcyclist will say, you looked right at me. Mm-hmm. And some people don't know how you could look right at something and not mm-hmm. see it. Um, there's a great book on this if you're interested in it or uh, called The Invisible Gorilla. And it's this experiment that you use a lot with groups where it shows a one and a half minute video where people are moving in circles, passing little basketballs to each other. There's uh, eight people doing that. And a person in a gorilla outfit walks through the middle of the scene for about 20 seconds of the minute and a half video, stands in the middle and does a little dance and walks out. And I've shown this video to hundreds of groups. And then you ask how many people in the crowd 
um, you ask them to count the number of times people are passing the basketball. And then you ask how many people counted this number. And then you ask how many people saw the gorilla. And normally about half did not see the gorilla. Because the people passing the basketballs are wearing white shirts, the gorilla is dressed in black, and they don't see it at all because they're counting something else. And it just works over. Now, it won't work for anybody who's listening to this podcast or watching this video because I ruined it. But actually, I should say that I've shown it before, and somebody said, you know what? I I had seen this before, and I I couldn't remember what it was, and I still didn't see the gorilla. (laughs) Um, oh, ouch. Like, yeah, and, no, and you would and you would think to yourself that's not possible and yeah um, but we do this kind of thing all the time right you open a refrigerator yeah. and you know something's been rearranged and you're looking you're staring right at it but you can't see it this is what's i think this is what jesus is getting at with the f- forgive for we don't know what we're doing and so we need communities and conversations and friends that help us see these things to mm-hmm. remember the new things and to remember, to put back into membership these things that we have dropped out of those that we're counting, the things that we're uh, considering to be a member of our community. And toxic masculinity, man, this is one. There are so many reasons because so much of our culture is built around it. We don't want it to go away. Like there are right. issues in our society that really we're, they're there because we don't perceive them. We don't see them. We don't understand them. Then there are some that are there because we've stared the cold truth of that of that uh, oppression in the face right. and have said, we'll stick with it. Right. Uh, yes. So yes. I, I don't want to, I don't want to let us off the hook though. Um, like I hear what you're saying, Doug and Laura, and I agree with you, but I also think that there are ways we are very conscious of what we're doing inside the church and how we interpret biblical passages and the way in which we don't allow suffering to speak and really create congregations of accountability. Uh, I was listening to a podcast uh, recently, and I forget the author's name, but she was talking about this conversation and she was talking about the way in which our refusal to, you know, study and kind of speak the truth of the text around uh, sexual violence in particular has created an atmosphere where many of our churches are a, di- a, di- a, den, of, a den of thieves, mm-hmm. where we have created spaces where sexual predators feel safe within our congregations because they know that we're not going to actually go into the text to the degree that we should around all of the texts that raise the issue of sexual violence. Like when we talk about David as a man after God's own heart and we just stop there and we don't really reckon with what he actually does with Bathsheba and we don't talk about how he didn't learn his lesson and therefore didn't teach his son and therefore you get the rape of tamar when you don't talk about queen vashti when you talk about the history and the rise of esther you are contributing to toxic masculinity and rape culture as a pastor as a minister as a congregant and so we are complicit in the way in which we teach and preach the gospel when we don't reckon with what's in the actual text because we know that doing so is going to create an atmosphere where certain people oftentimes large financial contributors to our congregation are no longer going to be comfortable and no longer going to be attending to our congregation so we make choices yep and those churches those choices are rooted in our own self-interest and because we haven't created a faith community that is consistent enough about making an alternative choice, people can make that self-interested choice without actually having to be held accountable for it. But and, what and, need- yeah. Yeah. and to yeah. Doug's point, sometimes it, we just don't want different, right? It's point blank. We are comfortable with the, and, and perceive that the way that masculinity and, and even biblical interpretation is absolute, you know? that there are so many times that we are in space that we're like this this one way of reading these words are the only way of right. reading these words you know this one way of being and showing up and expressing who men are that that's the only way to do it and and it's such a resist like it's a conscious resistance to your point of not wanting 
anything different, not wanting to see that sex trafficking is being talked about with Hagar, you know, like we're, we don't want to see that. Yeah. And, and look, I think you're right uh, on that, Dominique. And I'll say that, like, it's not letting people off the hook because you now acknowledge all the realities. Like it's a reality that people don't perceive and it's a reality that people ignore. And both of those are true. And what happens, I think, is we get in communities where some people are doing one thing, some are doing another. And when we cross the solution, so the person who's ignoring needs to be called to speak out the full truth. But there's a lot of people who would have heard the, the recitation you just did there, and they're like, I don't even know who Queen Vashti is. I don't right. even know that story of Hag. I, I didn't know that Esther was anything other than the queen who was brought for us such a time as this. They really don't know. And you're like, well, you read the whole book. Yeah, but I was, it was just getting to the end like that. I didn't even mm-hmm. understand that that's what's going on. Right. So I think all these things exist together. And um, when, when, we, when we put pressure on someone... You know, so in the, the, the illustration of somebody with a, mo- with a car that hits somebody on a motorcycle and says, well, you looked right at it and you didn't see it. To make that a moral claim, that you're just morally wrong and you chose to hit the person. No, that's not true. Now, there are times when people use road rage and they hit someone on a motorcycle. And those are different. And I think our critique of ourselves and our critique of one another, we just have to tell all the truths. And many times there are so many reasons why we do the things we do and don't do the things that that we do. And this is where it gets hard because a lot of us as faith leaders, um, we just don't have time for all this in our minds, right? We're like, I can't get into all of this stuff. I'm going to prioritize some things and not prioritize (laughs) others. And then we're encouraged by hearing, you know, conversations like this and others to say, Maybe we need to move this up on the list a little bit, and maybe we need to yeah. find some ways to talk about. It. So, Dominic, I, I don't know. Do you do, do you see that any any differently? Uh, no, I agree with you. I just don't think that in our conversation we had acknowledged that that piece of it yet. I oh, felt I like yeah. you acknowledged the the piece of sometimes we just don't see. I felt Laura kind of expounded on that a little bit more, but I didn't feel like we explicitly acknowledge the people who do see and yeah. choose yeah. not to uh-huh. actually uh-huh. do anything about what they know to be true and to be present within the text. So yeah. I just wanted yeah. in, in the in the same vein that you're talking about of uh, speaking to all the all of the complexity yes. of it, I wanted to make sure that we did name that that is very much at play within some of our communities. Mm-hmm. Which makes me think, you know, I, when the sexual allegations, um, the misconduct of Catholic priests started to really unpack, right? That was maybe 20 years ago now. I mean, I I know it's always been happening. I'm not saying that. I, I mean, when it started to really come out in our national consciousness, right? I feel like that was maybe 20-ish years ago. And I remember thinking, I remember going to my spiritual director, a Jesuit priest at the time, and talking with him about this. And his instinct to first protect the priests. And I was a mother of three, you know, my, I am a mother of three and uh, oldest was probably about eight at that time. And, and having this kind of anguish dialogue with him. Okay. uh, 20 years later, he's still my spiritual director. He's still alive, just older. And um, he doesn't lead. He doesn't lead with protecting the priests first. Um, of course, now we have allegations after allegations. I mean, even this week in the pre-show, right? Um, we were talking about a few churches that we know of that are are just being upended by sexual allegations of misconduct by men in authority. I mean, let's note that. there. I don't know of any allegation out there about a woman abusing her power and taking advantage of women or men in her flock. I mean, has anybody heard of that? <laughs> right. Okay. All right. I didn't think so. If you've heard of it, put it in the chat, right? Um, but I, where, where am I going with this? Sorry. Now I'm kind of lost in it. I, I, I there, there's a part of me that the, the, the obvious story that people can kind of come up with, and we've even seen it in our chat is, you know, why the heck do we even go to church? Why the heck with all this ugliness in the very bosom of the church, right? Uh, I'm done. I'm done with, uh, I think it was called by one, uh, one commenter, um, you know, the, the religious church, 
Um, and I think what she meant by that was the organized church. You know, why have anything to do with the organized church? And I have felt that off and on. I get that. And the fact that all of us on this call are still associated with an organized church <laughs> that, you know, we've probably put the best energy of our lives into <laughs> right. the organized church. I, I know I have, right? Um, I think speaks to this hunger we have for the transcendent God and this hunger that we have for that to somehow be manifest, made flesh, incarnated in a community. Um, which yeah. I, I, I just think I got, I got to name that too, right? That yeah. there is still something holy and good and beautiful that we're all longing for here, right? Mm -hmm. That and even with all this longing, shit, but, yeah. but, but manifesting, right? And, and yeah. being actively resistant to like showing up in congregations because, because we know that different is possible, right? We know that a different expression of masculinity is possible. We know that anti-racism in the church is possible. And if we are not present, how does it happen, right? Yeah, how how right. do we manifest it if we're not there literally walking in the, the um, presence and, and the image of Jesus doing right. the resistance work? Because we know, we know it is, it is cap that the church is capable of being this. And it's not to run away from it. It is to show up that much more, right? To be right. to be the conduit so that others can see who 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 Jesus has called us to be. Well, and I really wonder, you know, Laura. I think you're right. And and uh, the solution that I've found is just go to churches that have women leaders, right? I was a pastor for <laughs> a little over Amen. twenty years at a church that I started, and I, I left partly be my role, partly because I just thought. It, Having a, a person in my social location leading this community just not only does it not work anymore, it does it's doing harm. And mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, there's a black woman that leads our the community of Solomon's Porch now. And um, you know, and people I'm around people a lot who are like, I don't know any you know, like good women pastors, you know, they use this little qualifier mm -hmm. and I'm like, Well, there's mm -hmm. Stephanie's and Laura's and Danielle's and mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. there's so many, right? But mm -hmm. people don't know them. And I don't know if that's a cop out, right? Like saying, hey, the only way to get out of toxic masculinity inside of religion is to go to a church where uh, if there's going to be a role of a pastor, that's going to be a woman in that role. Uh, I don't mm. know if that's just, you know, uh, uh, cheating the, 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 the need to deal with this more thoroughly. Um, but it kind of feels like that's the only real way forward in some traditions. Now, I know there might be other traditions that have other ways, but the world's that... I'm involved in, you know, sort of the progressively minded, socially engaged evangelical traditions. I, I don't know if there's any other way to do it other than, um, you know, you, you change the practice by swapping out the people and just get okay. somebody else in there doing it. Uh, I'd be interested, Laura and Stephanie, if you, how you feel about that, because that might, you know, that, can, that can might sort of be like men saying, Hey, it's not our problem. We can't figure this out. Let's, you know, let's burden women now with solving the problem that we've created over the last X number of years. So that makes me deeply uncomfortable. But Dominique, so you're going to, before, yeah. before y'all answer that, um, I, I, I would want to, I would also throw out a recommendation, uh, a parallel recommendation from my friend uh Sung Chan Ra who said you know he famously said you know if you're a white church leader or church planter and you've never been mentored by a leader of color you're not doing missions you're doing colonization I would hmm. say creating a, a structure where we have a similar expectation for men if you are in pastoral leadership and you've never been mentored by a woman, then what you're actually going to be doing is some theological violence and out of your blind spots because you haven't been accountable to and submitting to the wisdom of women who can help you see some of the blind spots that you have. Um, so I think that could be also kind of a parallel proposal to uh, going, having a male leader who's humble enough and aware enough of his own blind spots to say, I need a woman to speak into my life and my formation and to help hold me accountable as I lead this flock that I feel called to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, good. and I think for me, um, church in and of itself is, is a deconstruction of, of 
so many of these structures um and and it's it's if it's already about a singular person who is the like whatever the pastor the leadership is problematic for me um because it it's that like hierarchy um that helps to again perpetuate and um the the dichotomies that we end up seeing and experiencing when it comes to all of the isms that that are you know across the board and um and and so what i hope to express and 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 model is this shared um accountability for everybody this shared um responsive and shared leadership shared you know and not like a leadership team like no everybody <laughs> like from the from the the two-year-old who crawls across the floor um in the middle of service is re is responsible and accountable for the community that we mm -hmm. are developing um in our spiritual practice mm -hmm. yeah, amen yeah amen i think that's a beautiful way of ending thank you stephanie for that yeah Man, I like talking to you guys on Wednesday. Well, I like talking to you any day, but I really like talking to you on Wednesdays. It's uh, mm. it's so good. Thanks, Likewise. thanks all for being a part of this. Uh, if you're a regular subscriber to this podcast, thank you. Share it with your friends. Uh, you know, a lot of podcasts tell you what to do. They tell you to go on and and give them stars and thumbs up and likes and all that stuff. I don't know. Do what you want. Um, but if you do if you do that kind of thing, do it for us too. You know, I don't know. Uh, there's no there's no implicit deal that you have to do something because you chose to listen to our podcast. Uh, and if you only watch online and you want the audio version of this because you want to share it with a friend and you know people listen, uh, we do have those available on all the places where podcasts are. If you don't know that world, you can go to Vote Common Good dot com slash podcast and get it all there uh, and if you want to see our faces and little comments from people that uh, they make during the live stream of this uh, you can get that uh, by watching over on youtube and facebook and twitter and all the places where we have these presents so hey thanks you guys uh really great chatting with you uh today uh the podcast will be back tomorrow and on friday in a, in, in a regular rhythm so we will uh we will see you all then great bye, bye.